So you say, oh, we don't need government. Of course you need government. Of course you need rational government. It's the irrational government that you don't need. So I don't know what a big, how big a story this is. Pure mozzarella sticks, da-da-da. I remember the first time I t smelled pizza, I, I thought it was human vomit. I, I told that story once. Someone in Hollywood loved that story. A very famous actor laughed hysterically. They remember it from 15 years ago. Because children generally see, and, see things and hear things almost pure in a pure manner. They don't know what, is, what they're supposed to see and hear. So if you approach radio as you would a child approaches anything, you'll be sure to entertain your audience and enlighten them because you approach it with the same cleanliness of vision as a child. So uh, I remember that. I was in a cousin's house in Pennsylvania. I had no, I was 10 years old. Never heard of pizza at the time. It was new to America. It wasn't really a big thing. It was like marijuana was still being smoked by jazz musicians at that time as opposed to uh, leaders, uh, heads of state and uh, heads of companies. Marijuana was re restricted to jazz clubs. At that time, pizza, who knew what it was? I remember I was upstairs in the attic, and a smell came wafting up, and everyone was down in the kitchen. They were like, I don't know what they're eh, talking about, something. Went down the winding staircase to this little house, and there was a scent coming up that smelled like, I'm sorry, someone had regurgitated. I didn't know what it was. It smelled bad. And they were leaning over like a weird cardboard box, like almost in prayer, like looking at it and talking about it. Talk it was almost like a palpable item. Like a living creature, the pizza was in the box. Touching it, poking it, smelling it. Hey, Michael, you want a piece of this stuff? I said, what is it? It's a pizza pie. No, thanks. I, I didn't want to eat it. Well, today I'm addicted to it. I don't eat it much because I don't eat cheese. Immediate the legs blow. I, if I eat any dairy whatsoever, the ankles, the knees, the fingers go out immediately. I have a reaction to dairy. Now, why am I talking about it? Because I'm tired of talking about death and dying. I'd rather talk about wood in your, in your Parmesan cheese right now. I think wood in Parmesan cheese is less adulterated than, than some leaders of technology companies are. Scalia's hunting trip was a gift from a friend, here we go again, who had business before the Supreme Court last year. The reportable gifts, sorry, I'll bring it up again, if you just joined us. May he rest in peace, he was a great man. However, who paid for the trip? Well, the trip was a gift from the ranch's owner. Okay, that's fair enough. How did he get there? Did he go by Greyhound? No. Did he fly coach on Delta? No. He flew on a charter jet. That's a reportable gift. That's a Menendez job. Sorry. So you have to look into that. Was Scalia, sorry, breaking the law? Now, I know, oh, what you say is a sacred cow. It's like saying Ronald Reagan, anything wrong about it. It's like some people are such fanatics. If you say anything about Ronald Reagan that's not, that doesn't elevate him to Godhead, you already violated some protocols. So R Ronald Reagan wasn't perfect. He was a good man, reasonably intelligent. They're making him into a founding father already. He wrote in longhand on a yellow pants. So do I write in longhand on yellow pants. So what? Does it make me a founding father? No, it makes the fact that every book I write is a bestseller. That's what it makes. So I want to get back to the issue of the big issue of the day, the issue, the big issue of the day, the death, the apple, the fall to the apple. And I want to go back to one other issue on the Scalia death, may God rest his soul. Because Gawker is wrong when they say Scalia's hunting trip was a gift from a friend who had business before the Supreme Court. That is such a smear job. That you've got to throw away immediately for one reason. The case was denied, as are 99.9% .9 of all cert petitions. I had a cert petition filed in a case by... Someone who's been uh, hasn't paid me or given me back my archives, even though they lost four years ago. Supreme Court threw his case out. They didn't even look at it. Everyone knew they wouldn't look at it. It was used to delay, 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 and den deny giving me what I'm what I'm owed. That's all. So in this case, he had nothing to do with this. Now, getting cert granted could theoretically be evidence of corruption, but in that case, you need to co-op three other judges. That didn't happen here. This is not a corruption thing. This was an age discrimination case before the Supreme Court that did not even make it past the summary judgment stage at the district court level because the guy suing was not able to make out a prima facie case of age discrimination. So what happened? The dis district court dismissed it. The Fifth Circuit affirmed the dismissal. And then the Supreme Court just declined to step in. It's identical to what went on with me. 
They lost that case against me at the uh, uh, arbitration level. That wasn't enough to avoid paying me what they lost. They take it to a district court and to an, to an Obama appointee, no less, a female Obama appointee, who, again, throws the case out, says, what, are you kidding me? You lost this case. Get out of here. She was very fair. That wasn't enough for him yet. Then he had to take it to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, a liberal court. Did they find against me? No, they threw it out. So what did he do next to avoid paying me and giving me my, my archives? He went to the Supreme Court knowing he couldn't win. They threw it out. They wouldn't even look at it. So believe me, I know a lot about the law after all of these years of having been subjected to the law and having spent a small fortune in defending my rights. I know a little bit about it. It's not just an academic sub a subject for me. It's the fault of the apple. So we started this segment by singing, uh, if the moon hits your eye like a bigger pizza pie, that's a moray. I talked about the Parmesan cheese you sprinkle on your penne. <laughs> Oh, God, could be wood. Could be wood. I laughed at the story. I jumped on it when I saw it on Drudge because every time I've seen Parmesan pre-ground in the uh, the containers from supermarkets, it looked like pieces of cellulose to me. It looked like 80% cellulose and like 2% a whiff of cheese, like the fumes of cheese and, and cellulose put, to put together. It's a shame. I used to like M a Romano anyway. I'm a Romano guy. I don't like it. I don't like the Palma. I like the Romano. Give me the veal palm without the palm, please. Or if I go to a certain restaurant in uh, San Francisco, I get the eggplant palm with no palm. That's better anyway. Oh, man, eggplant without cheese is even better. Nothing wrong with it if you like cheese. I, I love dairy when I can eat it. My dog loves it. Look at him. 12 years old, going strong. He's not limping, nothing. He's more sprightly than most talk show hosts. At 12 times 7. Does that still count, Robert? that a year in a dog's life is seven years in a man's life. It doesn't because they live longer. They go, I mean, you have to live to 120 now. These dogs live to 18 years old, 20, so that doesn't count seven as one. True, when I was a boy and my dog died at nine of a heart attack from the family food, that was seven to one. He was like 56, oh God, well, same age as my father, almost the same thing, from the diet, the same diet and kennel ration. I don't know what was in kennel ration. God, what they got away with in those years, God. The cars stank. The pollution was overwhelming. I almost died from a classic car I have the other day. I have a 1961 Jaguar XK150, black, like a restored beauty. I bought it in L.A. about a year ago. I never drive it. I've been driving it because the weather was good. Well, anyway, the point is, is that the smell coming out of it, you could die from it. Now, maybe the, the fuel is too rich. I don't know what's wrong with it. But the pollution from cars in the 50s and 60s? Are you joking? I mean, I had a Cadillac, you know, you needed a gas mask to, to take a ride in it. I mean, see the USA in a Chevrolet? In those days, you needed a gas mask. It was like driving around in a gas chamber. Just the fumes that came into the convertible from, like, the, the reverse flow underneath the bumper. And by the time it passed, like, the, the airflow under the car brought the fumes back in, it could have killed the whole, <laughs> the whole family. It was unbelievable those days. I mean, the food was polluted. The cars were polluted. The water was toxic. You say, yeah, the good old days. It wasn't such good old days. I mean, you could be a realist. So now we're living in these days. That's all. Now what do you want to talk about? I got great callers on the Apple not complying. Tim Cook, they think, should be in chains. <laughs> all right, Mr. Cook, come with us. Could you imagine if someone has the audacity, the FBI, to go in with 12 men with the blue suits? Uh, we're, com we're coming to take, it, take in the CEO for contempt of court. You can't touch me. I'm Tim Cook of Apple. You know who I am. I'm a friend of the president. See, none of these guys, they think that they're too big to be touched. They think they're above the law. They can just spit in the face of the FBI. I was taught as a boy that if you're pulled over by a cop for any violation of the law, always agree with the cop. Don't argue. Don't be a Philadelphia lawyer, my father taught me. And the uncles, too, don't, don't argue with the cops. Say, yes, sir, give them the license and take the ticket and shut your mouth. I said, what do you mean, even if I was, didn't go through the light? Yeah, you fight it in court. You don't, you don't argue with the cop. So how come Tim Cook that didn't learn that? Where did he grow up? Obviously, he didn't grow up in Queens. I'll be back. Friends, 
news. America is in turmoil right now. Turmoil. I don't have to outline every little detail, but let's start with the obvious, the big story. Nuke material stolen in Iraq a year ago. Fear of ISIS dirty bomb. Now link that with Apple's CEO refusing to comply with a federal order to turn over an encryption key in order to see where the terrorists went, who they were talking with after they slaughtered all those people in San Bernardino. Don't tell me there's no relationship. There is. We're not talking about uh, privacy in a time of peace. We're not talking about privacy in a vacuum. We are talking about privacy versus safety. Now, I recognize that old Ben Franklin, while he was not flying kites, was writing some interesting things. I know Ben Franklin wrote that he, those who are willing to give up a little uh, liberty for a little safety will have neither. I, I know all of that. Trust me, I, I know a little bit about the history of America. I don't have to wear it on my sleeve every minute and quote the Bible or the Constitution to know. And we all read it in high school and therefore. We didn't write it. None of us wrote it, despite what you may think. Nobody actually wrote the Constitution who was living. I don't know if you know that. It was actually written a long time ago. It wasn't written as a best-selling book. We all understand that, but I'm warning you that we have new issues at hand here. When you have the head of, C uh, of Apple saying, no, no, I'm not going to comply with a judge's order, I'm not going to help the FBI unlock the phone belonging to the San Bernardino Muslim terrorists, and I'm going to resist a federal judge's order to access that encrypted data hidden on the cell phone, even though there's nuke material running around with fear and ISIS attack, something's wrong with this picture because the FBI is f trying to find out if anyone helped plot or carry out the attacks. More than that, I want to know who's on the phone. Who did they call? Where are they? They're still in America? What agency are they working for? See, this is another question. <laughs> you see, you want me to go into the fiction writer in my head? Let me do this for you now. Who has the key to those phones right now? That phone right now? Not the government. Who has it? Apple. So Apple could have unlocked that phone already, right, Robert? and looked into who they were talking to, and maybe there's an embarrassing connection somewhere. Again, nothing to see here. Keep on moving. See, you want to talk about things in terms of two dimensions or old school thinking, go ahead. I think in six dimensions at once. I do. It's that simple. I was given a kaleidoscopic mind by God, and I developed it my whole life, and I wasn't born yesterday. So there may be another angle to the whole Apple uh, standing up for privacy rights than you may see. Try to remember what I just said to you. Right now, Apple is the only entity that can access the terrorist phone. How do you know they haven't already done so? Remotely. And maybe there's some linkage in the phone calls that's embarrassing to, let's say, certain people in and out of government. Good fiction story, isn't it? Read a time for war by Michael Savage. It has a little bit about encryption in it and making cars and planes stop while they're moving. Savage.